Have a, All right, I'm going to go ahead and jump into this right now. Light and fast look at the pressure testing. Come on in, Nick. Need to pay right. attention to this, radiator systems. All right, so pressure, pressure and general guidelines. This is just general guidelines, right? This is transmissions in general. It's got to give you an idea of what's going on with this. You see this right here? You got to, this is all your gear ranges, slow idle, fast idle, wide open throttle. And uh, that's going to be getting ready by building a drawing or drawing a table like this one here because you're going to put the numbers down on that. Okay, you got to make sure you know where the pressure gauge is going to be connected to. Now you can look that up, it's going to be, it's going to tell you, it's going to show you the port. Now there's several ports. You can't just find a one-eighth pipe plug port, screw it out, put your gauge there and think you're in the right spot. You got to know where you're going to hook up. So you're going to do mainline pressure at uh, each range and idle. Uh, that says PP, but that's actually supposed to be PR in the, uh, you know, Prindle. And that's your, and so this is, make sure you know where you're connected. And you're going to go right here. You're going to see this right here when you're in the, when you're in the, this, we're using all data particularly right here. Of course, we got some other stuff we use too, but for, just for looking at all data, uh, component tests and general diagnostics are typically where you're going to find this kind of thing. You'll find a lot of information about pressure testing and all that and where to hook your gauges up and that kind of stuff. All right, the idle pressure's charts right here. If it's high, if the pressure's high and idle at all ranges, you got wire harness issues, EPC solenoid, main regulator route. So what happens whenever you disconnect the uh, power from the transmission on a lot most of the time, now not on every one, some of the new ones are different, it's basically going to cause all your pressures to be high because the EPC solenoid, when it's got no, you know, you know whenever you lose pressure, it's going to default high and it's supposed to protect it from slipping. Right, bam, it's going to hit hard. Do you remember when we did, we had that vacuum hose disconnected on that one out a while ago from the modulator? How harsh it, I mean, how high the pressure was and how it was trying to just jump out of the car and stuff? All right, low out of all ranges, this basically is going to run you through what you're going to be looking for. Now, these right here, valve body, cross leaf, gaskets, pump, separator plate, you know, some of these are all part of the same thing because cross leaks can be a result of all this other stuff. Cross leaks being from one passage to another valve body. Now, wide open throttle stall has got to be done with a park brake lock and a heavy foot on a broker service brake. Press the accelerator pedal to the floor. Wide open throttle in each range of quarter RPM. Five seconds. Just stay there five seconds. That's all you want. You don't want to damage anything, right? Now, your stall speed is really important because that's going to be a number you can use too. If your stall speed's low, there are certain things you need to look for. If your stall speed's high, there are certain things you need to look for. Uh, the stall speed in reverse will be a little bit lower. But you might also notice, and we'll cover this a little work, the pressures in reverse are always maxed out. See that? How the pressures are higher in reverse than they are anything else. Okay, you're obviously not going to do this in park and neutral because you don't want a wide open throttle in the nose gears for what? You know what I'm saying? All right, so when you're doing a stall test, before you do it, you always observe safety precautions. First, look for broke mounts or bad brakes. If your brakes are bad, you're all going to run all over something. Right? You got to be careful with that. Make sure that whenever you've got it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to chalk the wheels and lock the park brakes and stand on the brake really hard. And sometimes if you've got one that's really like when we're do, doing a stall test on that Bronco out there, uh, that, you know, it's pretty strong and it's kind of hard if the brakes aren't just right, it'll start trying to boil the tires. You know, you got to watch that. All right. If all the pressures are within spec and slow idle, uh, then the pump and the pressure regulator are functioning properly. Think about that. The pump and the regular pressure regulator function properly. If everything looks good, at slow idle. All right, if they're all low at slow idle, you got a potential problem with the pump, pressure regulator, filter, low fluid, or internal leakage. You notice they didn't even mention wire harnesses there, right? Okay. Uh, to help verify where the problem is, check pressures at fast idle. In other words, give it a little bit uh, of extra speed at idle. If the pressures read normally at fast idle, it usually means a worn pump but the problem could still be internal leaks. Now this is a flying, you know, we don't have time to stop and talk about this a lot, but this is going to be some good stuff, and you can review it later on YouTube if you need to. Now this right here, have the application chart for that transmission handy. This is basically which uh, what's being applied in each gear. This is a sort of a generic, you know, that you got for, and it looks really uh, pretty good park and reverse. In reverse, you might realize your direct clutch is on, your low reverse band is on, and your gear ratio is 210. Uh, we'll, well, we'll talk a little bit about gear ratios in a while, but um, and when you would use that kind of thing right there. All right, so look at this. Forward clutch is on during uh, first, second, third gear and drive. In second gear, 
you not only you got, got this one on, see the difference right there? Your front, front clutch. So if you basically had a problem in a gear, uh, you know, if you didn't have a problem in this gear, but you did have a problem in that gear, then this one here may be your issue. You got me? That's how you would look at that. Internal leaks will usually show a particular range. If a, for, a forward clutch leak would have a normal pressure in park, reverse and neutral, but have a low pressure in all forward ranges. You see that right there? That's basically part of that same chart that I showed you earlier. So basically, if it's low in overdrive, low in drive, or low in manual first only, see that right there, forward clutch or valve body and all that. So I mean, of course, you got a you know, forward clutch issues you could have right there too that I didn't highlight there. A direct clutch leak, and it's a direct clutch on well, the transmission. That's sometimes direct, sometimes for, they call it forward or direct clutch. It'll be the same, you know, basically the thing. So the direct clutch leak on the transmission, if that's equipped, will show a pressure drop when the transmission shifts to third and low pressure in reverse because in most cases, direct clutch is on in third and reverse. See? Reverse, direct clutch. Third, direct clutch. See, and it's not on in those other ones. You got that? That's what I was looking at earlier. All right, now, a restricted filter will usually show up as a gradual pressure drop at higher engine RPM. You ever notice how whenever you're giving it gas and your fil fuel filter is stopped up, how it starts out accelerating real good, and then you're losing power and losing power, and then it's doing this right here because it can't get enough fuel. It'll do the same thing with transmission fluid. Engine may be running good. Transmission may try to quit pulling because the filter's clogged, you know, that's on that. So a stuck pressure regulator valve will show up as fixed line pressure. Pay attention. These questions are on the test now. Uh, it's fixed line pressure, which means the same pressure all the time. See, and then you're in the pressure regulator valve right here. And it's supposed to be able to move freely in there, except it gets the springs. Now, faster RPM, faster pump speed, if it's got a stuck pressure regulator valve, you may see your pressure uh, increase with the pump speed in a situation like that. Okay, so with a stuck pressure regulator valve, there'll be no boost in pressure from the throttle valve or modulator system and no reverse boost. Uh, remember, a reverse has got the highest pressure in there. High pressure at, at idle, if the pressures are high at slow idle, that means pressure regulator throttle pressure problem. On older cars, a modulator valve, which is vacuum triggered, controls throttle pressure. Pre-electronic vehicles, and some of them that even have electronics, will have a throttle valve, throttle valve cable. Now, has anybody seen one of these this morning? You did, didn't you? You pulled one off of that old mobile out there. Okay, so, and see your pressures at idle right here. See what they're supposed to be, the pressure and EPC pressure on that. Electronic pressure control on the line, you know, you got to do different things on that. If the transmission has a throttle pressure tap, pressure gauge installed there will tell you that the throttle pressure circuit's a problem. TV pressure should rise with throttle increase. If you pull on that cable and watch it, your pressure, you should see it go. You know, because if throttle pressure goes up, so your modulator valve is going to raise the pressure when you got more engine load. If you're deeper into the throttle, it'll mean more engine load too, right? Okay. On GM units, without a throttle pressure tap, remove the TV plunger. That's the TV plunger is like right here. Uh, if the line pressure is now normal, it's a TV problem. If not, it's a pressure regulator problem. So basically, all of this is going to be related to the valve body issue, right? The reverse stall test is also a maximum pump output test. If you suspect a weak pump, that'll help find it. Uh, this will show up as low pressure and reverse stall, but all other pressures, including idle, will be normal. See, that'll mean your pump is just a little bit weak worn out somewhat. Now, newer ones include scan tool testing. You manipulate the pressures with the scan tool. I showed you a video on this a while back. Uh, this is something we did. We actually had the this particular scan tool uh, hooked up to the GMC, that green GMC we got, and we had the pressure gauge. See, just because you got a scan tool doesn't mean that you don't need to do pressure tests. <laughs> you know what I mean? So a lot of times you're going to need to do pressure tests even though you got a scan tool. And so what you do here is you look at the pressure. You notice that 40% uh, you can actually <laughs> increase it or decrease it with these buttons here on the scan tool, these function keys. Uh, you got 240 PSI on that, and then your EPC state, 80% uh, transmission pressure, 140 PSI. See that? You got 100, it's 100 pounds lower with 80% than it is at 40%. You got that? So the more current that you put through that EPC solenoid, the lower the pressure goes. That's why if you cut the wires going to it, or if it blows a fuse, or if the connector's unplugged, the pressure maxes out. You know, it's all about you know, protection. Now, calculating transmission slip speed for a P1870 code and a 4L60E is done this way. You've got to calculate the input speed. If the vehicle speed sensor RPM is 2,000, and you're going to see this on your scan tool, right? Then multiply that figure by the ratio of the gear being checked. So you're going to need to be able to find the gear ratio of the gear you're checking. 
You need to know that. That's an important factor. You got to know the ratio or it won't work. Assuming the overdrive ratio is 0 0.696, you know, that's going to be actually, that, that's an overdrive ratio, you can tell by the number. Multiplying that figure by 2,000 RPM would give a proper engine or input speed reading of 1,392 RPM. That's going to give you an idea of what your slippage is, right? If there's no slip, you'll have that engine RPM if you've got that speed and you're in that ratio. You got that? Assuming the overdrive ratio is 696, if there's no slip, I just gave it, so I put that same paragraph up there. Now subtract 1392 from the actual engine or input speed recorded. In other words, if your engine is turning faster than this, that's how much slip you got. When your torque converter is not supposed to slip if it's modulated up to 100%, right? Because whenever the torque converter comes in, it starts out, you know, going, you know, modulating to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and, and that's why if you don't have that uh, transmission fluid or friction modifier in it, as that torque converter is modulating up to, you know, through its uh, less and less slippage, it'll chatter and you'll feel stuff. And like on some of the Crown Vickies and stuff, whenever the friction modifier wears out of the fluid, it'll feel like you're driving over those little uh, asphalt strips that are leading up to a stop sign, <laughs> like that. Then you have to actually, you know, a lot of times you can service transmission and fix that. All right, and uh, hope uh, McBride's or turn into a skeleton. All right, calculating transmission speed for P1780 code. The slip window the PCM is looking for on GM linear transmissions is 130 to 800 slip RPM for seven seconds. If it sees that much for if that window, anything greater than 800 for seven seconds will flag a P1870 code. Got that? All right. Now, Familiarize yourself. If you want to become really proficient with the transmission pressure gauge, you ought to put a pressure gauge on your own vehicle and leave it there for one week while you drive that sucker around. And you watch those pressures. Now this is, going to, this is an assignment that I'm giving uh, McBride for special topics. He's got to do this on each one of his vehicles. And he's got seven vehicles. So he's going to have seven pressure gauges. Okay? You want to put it? Every time, and you do it on your motorcycle too. Uh, each time you drive the car, you ought to watch the gauge, but don't crash. And this guy had this gauge on a 65 uh, Impala SS that time when I was a kid. I'd ride with him, and I would see this vacuum gauge that was on the dash moving around. Like his vacuum gauge we had hooked up, except yeah. on the dash. Keep it in the green, you get good gas mileage. That's basically what it meant. I didn't know what it was back then. And I asked my dad, you know, because he was a mechanic, got a shop and all. I says, what's a vacuum gauge good for on the dash? He goes, that's something you look at while you're having an accident. If you're watching yeah. that gauge, you're going to crash. You know, that's basically what he's saying. In one particular episode, now this is this is this is TV done right, a TV show moment done right. In one particular episode of a certain TV show that I will not mention, a man's sports car got hacked so it was hung in third gear and would only go 50 miles an hour. They did this on purpose to kill the guy. Right? Uh, Wait, to try to kill him? Huh? You they were trying to kill him. Yeah, I mean it was on a TV show. Is what I'm saying. This wasn't in real life. Although oh. you can hack somebody's car and drive it. And you see thinking about them taking that Cherokee, taking control of that Cherokee and driving it off in the ditch when that guy couldn't do nothing about it? You know, because they got these connected cars now. But anyway, uh, this right here was a, a sporty car, a sports car, and he was in the city. And he was driving. He couldn't do anything except, you know, just try to keep from hitting folks. Uh, the good guy was a hacker. He connected the sports car's engine controller remotely to find out what was going on. And in addition to discovering malware in the PCM, this was what his screen showed, and this just blew me away. It was only on the screen for a second, but when I saw this, I went, wow, look at here. That's what he saw. <laughs> and this was on a TV show where it didn't matter. You see what I'm saying? But this is what you would see. Error, PO700. If it's a 700 series code, you've got transmission issues. This one here, error, PO783, 34 shift malfunction. <laughs> Because he said he was actually saying it's hung in third gear, and they didn't even show that, but just a brief instant. You see what I mean? I went back and found that show, and I took a picture of that screen. He also noticed the guy's got a tire that's low over here. You notice that on his tires, and that's basically he's got 36 psi right there, and 20 psi there. He got low tire pressure. Of course, that wasn't mentioned. You know, that wasn't. You know, but anyway, that was only, it was really impressive, I thought, that they went to that much trouble to put something that a mechanic would see that and say, that's what you would see if somebody did this. Of course, there was a previous screen that said malware detected. Somebody had uploaded malware into the guy's computer is actually what happened. Yeah. On that. Now you're ready for test, right? 
Ten questions. You got your we got your answer sheet right there. Let's go through this. Internal leaks will generally show up how? You're gonna trade papers with somebody when you're done. Remember what we said. We don't have an infinite amount of time. If all pressures are within specifications at slow idle, what does this tell us? System, what should you do first if stall pressures are low? If pressures are high at slow idle, what does this tell us? If pressures at stall speed are high in every range, you should do what? How can we look at the pressures and tell the pressure regulator valve is stuck? test show you a restricted filter. Stall testing should always be done what? you become better at recognizing abnormal pressure readings. A says it's best to start pressure test by checking TV pressure. Zach said it's better to start pressure test by checking main line pressure. Who's correct? Golly, yeah, you just messed me up right here. You getting caught up imagining these two guys having this conversation you can't come up with answers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. A picture right over here of them sitting here going, you know, doing the talking or something. Rubber fussing. Trade papers with somebody. The moment of truth is here.
Here you go. We'll switch. I'll give it to somebody else. I was say, you can get it. Robert got mine, you got Robert's, I got yours. Y'all don't even want to see This mine. is the answer key. Okay? Internal leaks will generally show up in a particular range. I knew that. In a particular range. You knew that, didn't you? <coughs> I didn't mark it, but I knew it. If all pressures are within specifications, it's low out of what tells us the pump and the regulator are functioning properly. Got it? When diagnosed in a TV mic or mic failure equipped system, what should you do first if stall pressures are low? Pull the TV cable to maximum or disconnect the mic failure vacuum line to see how it changes the pressure. We talked about that earlier, right? Were y'all listening or did you have me tuned down? Okay. If pressures are high, slow idle, what does that tell us? If pressure at stall speed are high in every range, you should look at the idle pressures. How can we look at the pressures and tell the pressure regulator valve is stuck? All of the above. These are the ones that will burn me sometimes on ASC tests because I have a tendency to machine gun those answers, you know, because I really do my best work when I'm answering them quick, you know. You ever go back and re-answer a question and get it wrong the second time yeah. when you had it right the first time? That's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Your first answer is usually your best answer. Occasionally, though, and all of the above will burn me because I'll see a right answer and I'll say, that's right, poof, and I'll answer it, you know. Uh, how can a pressure test show you a restricted filter? It will drop gradually at a high RPM. When you're really requiring a lot of fluid, you won't be able to get it. Stall testing should always be done both A and B under operating conditions after you check broken mounts or bad brakes. And finally, you, well, two more questions. How can you become better all the above? Become accustomed to normal readings, checking pressures on as many good cars as possible, installing a gauge on my own vehicle and driving and watching it for a few days. If you look at those and think, you can figure that out. You know what I mean? Anytime you're working with scan tools or anything else or oscilloscopes, it's, you're, if you gather good data from vehicles that don't have a problem, that's the best information you can store. Right? That's why we have digital storage oscilloscopes and all this. If you're watching all these things and you know what it's supposed to look like, it'll stand out like a sore thumb when it ain't right. That's why it's a good idea to do this if you're serious about it. And this one right here, Zach is correct on this. Robert A. bombed out on that one there. So, um, Zach says it's better to start a uh, pressure test by checking mainline pressure. Who's pressure? You only got three rounds. I got about ten on my spot. I got a 50%. Everybody happy? Nope. I must five two. No, you only missed three. I missed five. No, I missed three. You missed three. We both oh. missed five. Now remember, you can go back and review on YouTube. And the rest of you guys can too. And no, I didn't tell you everything you need to know about pressure testing on every vehicle. I know I'm probably going to get an email about that. But uh, I appreciate you little partners watching my Wild West show though. Okay. I'm trying to learn something from it. Yeah. <laughs>